thank you all for your agility and uh, nimbleness to join us by Zoom during the great flood of 2022. Um, does anyone need a hug or a pep talk? Um, I'd love to see a show of hands. As a matter of fact, I would love to see a show of faces. If you would be so kind, uh, would you turn your cameras on um, so that we can get a sense of the class? Please turn your cameras on. We'd love to see that you are there and present. And I'm also going to invite you to meet uh, one of your classmates in just a few minutes. So do turn your cameras on. That is my request. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Harry. Um, it's good to see you here tonight. So um, as you know, the Haas School of Business suffered a burst water main the other day and thousands of gallons of water streamed down the, um, the stairs into the courtyard into our beloved Anderson Auditorium. We were just getting the hang of being back in class together and then all of a sudden we're back on Zoom. So we're going to do the best we can tonight. We've got a wonderful guest, very talented entrepreneurial leader named Bentley Hall, who's going to join us in just a little while. Um, before we get there, I always like to take an opportunity to share with you what's blooming in the garden. Anybody know what this is? What this flower is or what this flower is going to become? Can you put it in the chat? If you happen to have a guess, can you see it? Yeah. Magnolia, fig, eggplant, eggplant. Oh, eggplant. Yep, aga is correct. It is a lemon. That's a lemon blossom. Those little, if you look closely, you'll see that little green thing here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that will become one of these, a Meyer lemon. So um, pretty extraordinary, the, the um, aromatics of the lemon. And then this only lasts, this is very ephemeral. This is a fountain of cherry blossoms. This is a weeping cherry tree that only looks like this for a day or two every year. So I always rejoice in um, this moment. And, you know, in the face of all of this um, beauty, we're also um, struggling with the consternation of uh, this ongoing war in Ukraine, which every day I read stories about the implications of um, the suffering that people are experiencing. You know, we're here displaced tonight, <laughs> just subtly to go back to our computers and not have our classroom available to us. But I was thinking today just how much strife um, people are experiencing being uprooted and having to evacuate and become refugees in other countries. And um, I just want us again to, in solidarity with the people who are suffering, to um, send good thoughts and also to be helpful and extra kind to anyone in, um, in need. Uh, we do have students at Berkeley who are of Ukrainian descent or who are here from Ukraine. We have faculty and staff members, and um, I know they can all use our, our hope and our wishes and, um, and our good thoughts. So let's, let's um, borrow Raj Patel's word and uh, just sit tonight in solidarity with their um, well-being and a hope for the end of this invasion and um, and and all of the um, interdependent ramifications it has. Um, I'm showing you right now a slide of food politics. I think I mentioned early in the semester that I wanted to point you toward what I consider to be trusted sources of guidance. And food politics is a weekly or a daily. Um, newsletter that Marian Nessel writes. And Marian Nessel is kind of the godmother of the food studies movement program. She's been a professor at NYU for many years, but also a guest professor at Berkeley. She's a good friend of our program. She's come to this class several times. And I just really look to her for um, important guidance. She's just like a 
she reads everything and she compiles this daily newsletter. So I wanted to put it on your radar. You can subscribe to it. But today's um, news was particularly upsetting uh, about our this new spending bill that our Congress has passed, and they've left out this school food waiver. And it's very painful, going to be very painful for kids. When you look at the uh, military budget and you look at what else is being spent in the billions and trillions of dollars to have the food budget for students and for children be less than a fraction of a percent is just painful. And I guess what I wanted to say to you tonight um, as a as some guidance or encouragement is that I think if you're going to play a role in food systems change making um, to address health and climate and people's well-being, you're going to have to be active in politics. It's just really clear that our Congress does not appreciate the food systems interdependencies that you're learning about here because if we're not investing in getting kids fed during the day, they're not going to grow up to be capable, healthy, contributing members of our um, culture and our communities and our society. And um, it just, it's heartbreaking to me. So I wanted to encourage you to follow Marion Nessel. Um, I also think that like in times like this, when we are stressed and we are distracted that we need to be able to turn to true trusted sources of information. And I think Marion is just that. So I was thinking a lot about um, comfort and <laughs> comfort food. And um, I was also thinking about stress eating. And um, I wanted to now uh, create a quick opportunity for you to, to meet uh, one of your fellow students for just three or four minutes and brainstorm together um, what meal what might you make for one another that would be the most comforting, the most healthy, and the best for the planet. Like right now, if you were just going to invite this classmate over, we're going to put you in a in a breakout um, at this time. And if what what meal would you would you have? So um, please turn your camera on if you haven't already. I'm going to put you into, um, let's see, breakouts of uh, two people. So you just get to meet one another. And let me just mention, I'm doing this in response to some good suggestions that we got from our midterm evaluations, which were really helpful. And I want to especially thank Kenneth and Kate for um, for, uh, you know, facilitating that and even more importantly, like summarizing your feedback in ways that, that the teaching team and I could really um, act on it. So one of the things many of you asked for, the 53 of you that did fill out that midterm evaluation, you asked for more opportunity to get to know your fellow classmates in this class. So here is um, a response to that. Here are um, some breakout rooms. Maybe several of you will have, um, let's see, I got to fix this number. Some of you may have- I've got it set up, Will, if you just- Okay, I got it. I'll go. Okay, okay. Here we go. So be back in about four minutes. Here we go. Let's see if it works. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, would you mind uh, or would you kindly go to the chat and uh, put in maybe what you want to name this meal or just describe it briefly so we could get a whole bunch of really good ideas for comfort, comforting, healthy, sustainable meals right now. And we'll uh, collect this, ooh, a lot of nice soup, ramen, lentils, bean soup. Whole grain bread. Oh, that sounds really good. Pho, butternut squash. Wouldn't it be really great if we could all get together in a giant kitchen and do this? I'll have to figure out how to how to add that dimension to the class. That would be really fun. Okay. 
Terrific. Um, why not? I am going to let one of the teaching team members man the waiting room because we're still having a lot of folks just join us now. Um, we're going to now, uh, I just wanted to kind of set the stage for what's coming. You know, we've sent, we've spent the last six weeks or so meeting with um, really remarkable people. Um, and, you know, you've heard from a, a celebrity, you know, world changing chef, Alice Waters, probably the pre preeminent food journalist of our time, Michael Pollan. Uh, you met Anna LaPay, who's a, just a, an amazing second generation, um, you know, food systems advocate and change maker and author. We, of course, heard from Raj Patel and Saru. Um, we also, last week, we heard from Matthew Rayford. I was really reflecting a lot on Matthew's talk, and um, it was like nothing I had ever experienced before. And um, I just want, I was wondering if, you know, if any of you had just been reflecting on it too, because I've been trying to think about how, um, well, first of all, how authentic it was, but also just it really, to me, like, um, expressed kind of the way a system's mind works. He was just connecting everything. But I wanted to invite you to uh, do build a word cloud with us right now. And, and Pooja's going to put the, um, uh, the, the prompt uh, code. I'll, I'll show you the prompt. What one or th one, two or three words would you use to describe Matthew Rayford's talk last week? Like what what impression did it make on you? And uh, Pooja will put in the chat uh, the link to the word cloud. And if you wouldn't mind um, putting those words in into the Minty. And then Pooja, do you, I'll stop sharing my screen and you can share the um, word cloud. We can see it come into motion. I just love to get kind of a collective sense of you know, what your takeaway, it could be just one word, but what would it be? Is it happening, Pooja? I'm looking for, I don't know why it's letting, letting me it. share it. It's, it's, it's happening. Um, it's I don't hard know for me to the... see when I've got the screen going. Yeah, I don't see give your me one in the chat. Oh, it was, it. Oh, it, it went. Oh, there it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. People are populating it. So. Oh, okay. Good. Good. That's definitely in there. Uh, yeah. Okay. One second. Got it. Not letting me pick the screen that it's. Oh, here we go. Cool. Thank you. Well, when we're on Zoom, we try to do things we can only do on Zoom. So. Okay, a lot of in, in, inspiring there. That's nice to hear. Passionate, confusing, thought provoking. Yeah, time management. Wow, he was really into time management and multitasking too. Did anybody write down multitasking? I thought that was pretty extraordinary how many things he had going on at once. Okay. Oh, a couple people, you know, had a contrary view to it uncomfortable unfiltered, inappropriate. Um, well, thank you for sharing those. That would be interesting to talk about more sometime. If you have thoughts on that and want to talk to me or any of the teaching team, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, controversial. Yeah, brash. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Maybe we can save this when it gets to its final Mm -hmm. thing and you can you can take it down now so um we're going to make a turn now in the class we've just heard from you know a really diverse group of thought leaders and for the next portion of the class to the finish line we're going to be focusing on the realm of entrepreneurship and we're going to be getting inside the mindsets and skill sets and tool sets that entrepreneurial leaders and founders bring 
to really working to reinvent the food system that as we know it. And um, we are going to be also taking your feedback into account and um, evolving and editing our assignments just a little bit to again create more student to student interaction. We'll try to do that in the auditorium and we'll do it here online. And we'll also be building more um, specifically toward your final project where you are going to get an opportunity to express your own personal vision, mission, and values um, with respect to how you would be a food systems change maker and where you would apply yourself in that system. I want to invite Allison, a member of our teaching team, to join us here. I'm going to spotlight her in the scene with me. Um, and Allison's going to take you through, kind of give you a preview of um, what's what's next for the assignments uh, before you go on spring break next week. Yeah, uh, Will, do you want me to screen share? Yeah, or do sure. you have the slides up? Or you want me to? Yeah, right. here, I got it for you. I got it. Um, Either way. Um, Hi, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying our extra hours of daylight this week. OK, let's see. Share screen. OK, there you go. Awesome. Yeah, so we are all on spring break next week. Yay. Um, so I hope you all take time to relax and rest and rejuvenate. Um, for the following week, so there are going to be some discussion posts, um, a reflection on this week, and two additional discussion posts. And then as well, as Will mentioned, we are going to be focusing a lot of the upcoming assignments on your final paper and really building towards this entrepreneurial way of thinking about food systems in the way that we've been talking in this class. So uh, all of you for this week put a discussion post up about a problem statement and a vision and a mission that you're thinking about. And looking on B courses, they look really, really great so far. You're all interacting with each other. There's some really interesting thoughts and ideas up there now. So for the 30th, take feedback that you're getting from your peers, think about it, maybe spend some time next week reflecting, and we want you to refine that, and so that's what you'll be submitting for the 30th. Um, well, if you can go to the next slide, I just wanted to go over the, the specific prompts. Um, one thing that was brought up in your mid-course evaluations and that was brought up by your class rep was just some requests to talk about how to get full credit on the assignment. And one thing that we've noticed on the grading side of things is that people aren't always addressing every aspect of the prompt. So keeping an eye on the prompts and keeping an eye on the rubric when you click on this assignment in B courses, um, just below this, I took this screenshot last night, just below that is the rubric. So that's right there in front of you as well. And just make sure that you're answering all the different components of the question. And really, as we think about building towards, you know, this final paper, one topic that you want to address in the food system, think about what you're taking in from this course. What speakers, what readings have spoken to you? How do they relate to a topic that you're interested in? Maybe it's something that you've thought about prior to this class. Maybe it's something that is in your brain because of things that we've covered in class. Maybe something we're missing in class and that you haven't had a chance to talk about or think about or read about. So think through, you know, read through this whole prompt. Um, please, please, again, just connect to what you're thinking about. We wanna, we wanna see how you're applying what you're getting out of this class to your own work and where you're going. Um, I well think said. that's about it. Yeah, well said, I like that. I think, you know, one of the things we're gonna see from the entrepreneurs that we meet with over the next couple of weeks is that they've aligned their own sense of purpose and their passion with their skills. And when that happens, we get a incredible force of energy and nature and the kind of um, determination and vision that um, helps to um, really reshape the system of supply, which is really the um, definition of entrepreneurship. So thank you, Allison. 
really appreciate your work and help on the teaching team and for that explanation. And um, now I'm going to, uh, to have the pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker tonight. Um, Bentley Hall is the Chief Executive Officer of Good Eggs. Uh, Good Eggs is really a pretty amazing company that is reinventing the system of supply. And um, I've known Bentley for many years in a number of different incarnations. And I have to say that um, when Bentley took the, the um, what do you want to call it? I don't know if you want to call it the wheel or the rudder or the helm at Good Eggs. Good Eggs was not a happy place um, at that moment. I mean, you, you'll, you'll say more Bentley, but it was, it was really challenged. The original business model, the original uh, hypothesis of how it was going to work was not working. And Bentley was called in um, with his experience at Plum Organics and other companies to really write the the ship and get it on course. And so I think his story and his perspective um, it, are so relevant to what we're learning tonight and this semester. And I've asked Bentley to kind of give us an overview of this um, supply chain and distribution. And last night, Bentley shared a wonderful uh, Fresh Air episode, which I did get to listen to this morning. I don't expect many of you did, but we might reference that um, later um, because I think it is salient. But Bentley, let's just assume that nobody really got to listen to that. So if you want to go to go into the nuances of how the industry changed these last hundred years, that would be quite welcome. So without further ado, please let's have a warm welcome for Bentley Hall of Good Eggs. Thank you, Will. Can you hear me? You bet. It's great. Good. Thanks for having me, everybody. Oh. Sorry, there's floods and other craziness today. <laughs> um, I, I hope I hope today will be a fun evening where we get to learn together um, around our, our Zoom tables before your spring break. That that gives me good recollections of a time, <laughs> a time when I was in school too. Um, I'm Bentley Hall, as, as Will mentioned. I'm a dreamer who does, uh, a dad of two very hungry boys who are seven and 10 and eat a lot of food and the CEO of Good Eggs. Um, I think probably each of those are equally important. Um, and to, to Will's point, I actually, I, I just still remember meeting you, Will, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 years ago um, when Plum was just Cheryl, Neil, and I in Cheryl's basement. Um, and just being really, really impressed with what you had built in the past, your, your purpose and your soul and, um, and, and how you've built some incredible businesses over the years and have done that while being gracious. So it's uh, full circle for me. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, I've been helping really purpose-driven food companies scale for almost 20 years, uh, from Cliff Bar really early days to Plum Organics where I was for eight years. And then uh, I joined Good Eggs six years ago. But yeah, it was definitely a turnaround, which we may or may not get into uh, later in this call. And and you mentioned this, Will, but for me, like food has always moved me. It 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 continues to move me, and it always has. And so I actually loved your question about what meals bring us comfort. But my my most vivid memories personally all rev revolve around really long days in wild nature, followed by cooking simple, fresh meals with family and close friends. Um, with lots of laughter like that's a that's a really good day to me and hopefully most of you who are in this class feel this way but food is one of the most personal experiences it is one of the most powerful forces for positive change in the world I, I believe that a perfect meal can bring joy it can sustain health it can connect us to a community it can ground us in our planet and I think it's really fundamental to not just human survival but a full existence um, and in short, I think it matters and I care deeply about it. And so um, I'm happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about the food industry. Um, today, we're going to discuss a few things. And really, there's, there's a brief history of grocery and food systems. That'll be a Cliff Notes version. It will not be boring. It should be fun. Uh, I'll dive then a little bit into how grocery and food distribution flow works and how the category and the consumer have been changing over the last couple of decades and that's certainly been accelerated over the last couple of years. Um, and then I'll end hopefully 
think we'll have enough time to just take a sneak peek at the future of food and how Good Eggs is approaching that and how we're leading change in the midst of a pretty crazy uh, transformation and evolution of a huge category. And then I think we'll end with some Q&A around our, our virtual Zoom, Zoom, Zoom fire. <laughs> so that's the plan for today. Yeah, sick. Uh, my only other note before I get into it is I, I, in general, I find like Zoom not optimal. It's the life we have. I would rather have a dialogue with smart people versus talk at them any day of the week. So um, I don't know how your class does this, Will, but I personally welcome whether you raise your hand or jump in with chat with questions and ads. Uh, I, I like a good dialogue. I second that. We invite any kind of interaction. Um, it's a little tough sometimes technically to navigate, but um, yeah, I would invite people to put um, their questions in chat. Generally, Bentley, what we do is we let you talk for a bit and then we, you know, we can engage in more of a conversation and I can, you know, I can call on students or, you know, I can moderate, you know, a little bit, but just, you know, carry on and we'll do, we'll make it as interactive as possible. And every now and then, you know, the 145 students who are here tonight, they can chime in and put something um, nice in the chat, like good point point Bentley or that's cool or I heard you you know just so we know you're there you can also disagree I don't have a monopoly yeah it could be that too that sucks okay anything we'll take we'll take it all okay all right um, thank you thank you Will all right I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom zoom back and out then and talk about how how we shop and buy food and groceries has changed over the years and there's some pretty to me fascinating and distinct cycles over the last call it century that I think is really actually important to understand before we start looking ahead. Um, and instead of making you listen to a bunch of podcasts and do a lot of reading, I will, I will give you the Cliff Notes version. And there's kind of, I, I would say like three or four chapters or phases. So let's, let's go way back to, I don't know, 1920s. Um, and I think people in general have this idyllic view of what it was probably like in the 1920s. Um, not, not, not to ruin dreams as a, as a dreamer who does, but it wasn't that good. <laughs> there, there was generally a local grocer and they ran a tiny, I don't know, 500,000 square foot shop with a super limited selection of essential goods, maybe two, 300 items. Um, and because they were a one, one two, store, two store family owned shop, prices were usually pretty exorbitant. Um, if you think of what was in that store, it usually held, I don't know, dry goods, canned goods, a tiny selection of vegetables that wouldn't spoil things like potatoes or onions or, or cabbage. It was owned by a local family and some of those families were great operators and uh, others, it was luck of the draw, uh, didn't necessarily run a really, a really good store. If you were lucky and they were good and they were on it, maybe you could find a little cheese or a slab of bacon. Um, and back then in the 1920s, the average family, I think it was something like a third of their income was spent on food, which we'll get to today, but that's an enormous amount relative to what people spend today. So let's just call that a, a, a chapter that was like up to the 1920s, um, which again, seems really far away. So let's, let's, let's move to phase two. Phase two was 1920s to maybe 1960s. And this, so this is a 40 year period. And it started with this little tea importer in New York, which you may have heard of called ANP. And ANP honestly changed everything. Um, there is a book that this guy, Mark Levinson wrote. Uh, he wrote the box, which is about Malcolm McLean who changed the shipping industry. He wrote this book, it's ANP something in the title. And it talks about this, this company's growth. Um, by the end of the 60s, uh, ANP was the largest retailer in the world. At its peak, it had 16,000 grocery stores in almost 4,000 communities, along with dozens of warehouses and factories, like really vertically integrated. 16,000 stores is a lot of stores. Walmart today, I don't know if this is US or global, has 5,000 stores to put that in perspective. Its presence, its dominance was so overwhelming that if you were in local, state, or federal government, you're, you were throwing everything you had, every weapon you had to push them to abandon what 
what they call discount pricing that they didn't think small producers and small retailers could compete with. So uh, that wasn't that long ago. That was 1960s. Um, and at that point, through, through many things, but really that was the primary thrust and the primary retailer, uh, food became more affordable than it had ever been before. They were just a machine. Uh, and the selection was definitely broader than those couple hundred SKUs in a you know, 500,000 square foot family owned store. But we're still talking maybe 3,000 items in a store. Um, still really small assortment relative to what we have today. So that's phase two in, I don't know, under three minutes. I'm sure there's many stories to be told about that. Oh, great point. Well, on, I'm seeing the chat here. Yeah, it was offered on credit. So you knew the people who bought it and it was, it was offered on credit. And I think you paid your bill, you're right, every month or something at your local grocery store. A different level of connection <laughs> to, your, to your retailer. Uh, let's, let's look ahead and jump to phase three. Let's call this the 60s, 70s through, I don't know, 2010, 2015, something like that. This, this relative to those past two periods feels pretty crazy to me uh, because there was really deep market segmentation and there was an explosion of items and SKUs, SKU pro, SKU proliferation. Um, this is when the idea of grocery store brands that were not just a and began to pop up. This is when mass retailers like Walmart and later Target uh, were introduced. This is where premium and natural folks like Whole Foods emerged. This is where we learned about dollar stores. This is where club began, Costco, Sam's Club. Uh, those are all new, very segmented retail formats. And during this period, it, it varies across those, those categories of those type of retailers, but um, the average grocery store had 50 to 60,000 SKUs. Again, go back, like it was 300, 500 SKUs, grew to 3,000. Now 50 to 60,000 SKUs, huge stores that we take as like the norm and, and is granted, but a lot of people fed themselves and their families with a much smaller format their whole lives. Uh, in my opinion, this is the area where we got miles of aisles. I don't know who needs two or three aisles of sliced bread, uh, but we happen to have that level of choice now. It's where we got limitless amounts of processed foods that not necessarily everybody needs, but we have access to. And it's a time where it, it somehow became acceptable to prioritize cost and efficiency and durability over freshness, taste, or health. So I'm gonna get into the future now, but before we get into the future, I, I think that's fascinating to think about those crazy changes and how different they are in these, uh, these couple decade periods. So I'll pause for a second uh, in this mini history and see if there's any questions or ads. Well, sounds like you have a couple of things. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I was just, um, I was just translating what a skew was. Ah, yes. We, we speak of skews, but it's not a term that is normally used in day-to-day -day language. So um, I was just pointing out that a skew is a shelf keeping unit, which is a technical term used for inventory management. And when you get into the consumer packaged goods, the CPG business, um, you start talking a lot about SKUs. Every single product that you have and every variation on it has to have its own SKU. So that's what Bentley's talking about, that we are now shopping in stores that have 30, 40, 50,000 SKUs, which um, adds to our confusion and our anxiety. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. That's a good reminder that I've been in this industry for a while. I take that for granted. Thank you for... Well, we haven't, you know, we just haven't broached this yet, so it's all new. So I'll, I'll keep translating if need be. Sounds good. Hey, Bentley, I had a thought on one of the things that you said, by the way. Please. Um, so I thought it was interesting you were saying about the 1920s, how it was the most that kind of the U.S. income has been spent on food with one third of it being spent on food. And previously in this class, there's this big discussion how like we're actually paying way less for food than we actually should be talking about the true cost of food. So I was kind of wondering your opinion on how like we actually used to pay more, now we pay less. 
And I don't know if the future ideally for sustainability and health means we pay more. Kind of what are your thoughts? Oh, very good question. Thank you for asking a question and making this a dialogue. I appreciate that. I mean, today we'll get into this actually in this next section, but today versus a third of income on food, um, it's 6% of household spending is on groceries. It, it varies a little bit, but call it like another five or 6% is on in out of home food, food spending. So call it like 12% of GDP or 12% of income is on food. So way smaller than a third. Uh, on whether it's, it, it's hard for me to answer that question from a, as a proportion, because like housing prices are so different, everything is different. Um, I, I personally think people can eat really healthy, nutritious, wholesome food um, from good vegetables and like basic bulk ingredients, if they have the skills and the knowledge on how to cook, which is not a given. Um, I think that proteins are what are what become really expensive, especially really sustainable proteins. Um, and so I think that's a that's a, a luxury and a choice that, that some people have and some people don't. I agree with Bill's point that cooking simple foods is a superpower that not everybody has been taught or knows. I'll well, and ironically, it's been completely removed from any curriculum. We've, yeah. been, we've been working really hard to try to get more teaching kitchen opportunities for students so that they can actually learn while doing, but it's just kind of been left out of both, you know, middle school, high school and college. So, and dorms aren't equipped for students to be able to, to cook in them. So it's a big opportunity. I'm just, I'm mentioning these things, students, because these are all change maker opportunities. You know, maybe Bentley, you can talk about a little bit, you know, later on about your own experiences of like looking around and seeing what's broken in your own world and going about, you know, fixing it. Cause that's really what we want to stir up in this class. Oh yeah. I got, I got, I got lots of those. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the quick CEO answer on this question too, and then we'll move, move ahead. But um, we, we have such high quality produce that is sourced direct and local um, that our produce is not more expensive than buying produce from a generic store, but it is in my opinion, completely different and much better. Um, our proteins are way more expensive than what you can get in a nutritional store because our threshold for what proteins, animal proteins or fish fuel carry is higher than what a traditional store carries. Um, so I think it kind of reaffirms this point. All right, I'll keep on cruising forward. So those are the first three phases um, in, a, in under five or 10 minutes. So let's talk about phase four. And maybe this starts in 2015, 2010 again, you can pick, it's kind of the same, same jam. Uh, I mentioned before, but groceries are a gigantic category. Uh, it is the largest retail category in the United States and fluctuates versus that in real estate. It's almost a trillion dollars in total spending just in the US. It is 6% of GDP in home and it is a core human need. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is it's big. And even when I got into food 20, 15 years ago, it was not a particularly sexy category. I mean, Will was really a pioneer in it. Um, it wasn't the category that a lot of people were studying and wanted to get into. <laughs> I happen to care about it, so I didn't really have a choice, but, but uh, it, it's also a big industry. Um, when I joined Good Eggs, the thesis about the category, and I'll actually pull up some slides from the past if, if a host can give me the power. All right, I have the power. Have the power. Thank you for giving, giving me the power. You have the power. All right, that's Mas Masamoto. He makes the best stone fruit and peaches, in my opinion, in the summer. I think Alex been, Waters actually uh, is one of his. Average. Yeah, and Moss has been a guest in our class. Uh, he's amazing, both amazing poet and an amazing grower. I digress. Uh, let me get my. Cannot read. Right. So the thesis when I joined Good Eggs, and this was six years ago, and Good Eggs started eleven years ago. So I I, I joined as well mentioned. Um, in, the, in probably halfway through Good Eggs history. But the thesis at the time was a trillion dollar market is transforming and it's transforming right now. And we believe that it was gonna 
there was two huge tailwinds that were driving this tectonic shift. One was this shift towards high integrity, great, good food. And two is a shift toward online and on-demand purchasing. And Good Eggs was at the intersection of those two trends. Uh, when I show this to all of you now, you're probably like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I understand. Um, the reason I mentioned this after all that history, Cliff Notes, is that six years ago, maybe 5% of people who saw these two slides, or literally the exact slides I would share, agreed that this would be a big opportunity. Now I show this and everybody agrees. Um, so that's an interesting sign of how quickly consumer behavior and sentiment really changes. Uh, we saw this early. And again, everybody thought this was going to be a really tiny niche. Um, I'm going to pull up another slide in one second. Before I do that, I'm actually going to pull out of grocery. And I'm going to talk about a different category. I think you had a time machine. I think you had a DeLorean. I don't know, Back to the Future. And, and go back to 1999. Uh, back, if, if you were ordering anything online in 1999, try to think about what it was like then. And I'll give you some primers. Uh, you're probably on dial-up AOL, which was not particularly fast service. The, the iPhone didn't exist. It was seven years out. I mean, it wasn't even in, it wasn't even in somebody's brain at that time. Amazon was five years old. And four of the, in, if the first four of those five years, all they had sold was books. Less than 1% of people in America bought anything online. And so that was not that long ago. Over the next 20 years, online became 12%. Now, now I think it's 14 or 15% share of overall retail. And we're used to ordering everything and anything from our phone or computer, getting it same day. Um, that, that shift, again, 99 to call it now, from less than 1% to 15% share. That's why I think this page is so fascinating to me. Can you see this page? Yep. So this, this one blows my mind because of the speed of change and because we're still in this early first chapter, this early evolution of this huge transformation in food. And again, for entrepreneurs or people who like wanna work on important hard problems, this should get you really excited and, and, want, want to, and make you wanna get out of bed in the morning and go build something great. So uh, this one back in 2018, which I'd been in the job at Good Eggs for three years then, two, 3% of groceries were sold online, two or 3%. That uh, has leapt to north of 10% um, in a really short time period. COVID was a big driver, but there was lots of other things too. And if you look ahead, um, it's pretty, pretty clearly, people agree, agree that it will become more than 20% of this category, which is huge. Uh, if I compare that to the DeLorean Amazon example, e-commerce, grocery is moving online somewhere between three and, three and five times faster then overall e-commerce moved online. So think about that. You're living in a period across all that history of the greatest change the world has ever seen in food in the largest category that really matters in the shortest amount of time. If I get out of the theory or the business case of these slides here, uh, think about like your life. You're able to eat anywhere, in and out of home. You're able to shop almost unlimited choice from multiple channels. And these category lines of like, is it a meal, is it a grocery, is it a food experience? They're really blurring. Um, it's more about what do I wanna fill my fridge and pantry with and cupboards and what do I wanna have for X meal? And you have a lot of options. Uh, so again, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think history is boring if you think about like the moment you're in. And I, I really personally, think that this is an amazing time to be in food. And so you get this business opportunity, you have a purpose that matters to you if you're in this class. That's a, that's a crazy combo. Any questions here or thoughts here? There's a question Bentley about is, are, is this data just mapping to the US or are you seeing this in other parts of the world, Europe and- Oh, good question. This is actually, the, the, the stats I'm giving you are US. Um, I actually lived in London, the UK, two years before I joined Good Eggs. Uh, at the time when the US was like 3% of 
on online penetration, the city of London was 18%. So uh, when I got here and nobody believed this was going to be a thing, it wasn't a theory. There was plenty of countries who were way ahead of us, Korea, Scandinavia, London, Europe. Like I can give, give a list of 10 countries that were way, way ahead of us and we still haven't even caught up to. So it's actually a really relevant question uh, and a good question. We're just behind. All right, hopefully, hopefully that excites this career a little bit. There's a lot of opportunity in that moment. That probably means you're going to be hiring a lot of people. I, I hope I hope so. We're up to 900 now, but we want we want to need more to grow. All right, I, 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 this is not meant to be a, a good eggs plug, but I think it's probably useful to explain what good eggs does so that as we get into the next section about where I believe food is going, you have some context. Um, in this in this 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 market dynamic, um, we spent the last decade pioneering a new approach that delivers peak quality, high integrity food, uh, and delivers the same level of convenience you would expect from the other players, but without a compromise on on jobs, people, humanity, or the planet. Um, this means we're doing things like sourcing seventy to eighty percent direct from local producers. Uh, that, to put in context, the average grocer is less than 1%. So it's a very different way of buying. And we'll get into that in a second about the flow of food. It's why we've, we've really worked hard to have a complete but curated assortment of items across premium groceries, absurdly fresh produce and protein, seasonal meal kits and ready-to-eat meals, and wine and spirits and beer to wash it down, but still being less than 5,000 total items in our store. So complete across categories, curated within those categories. It, it's why we've invested in over 1,000, no, 800 jobs in the Bay Area now that pay living wages um, and have equity in the company and have good, good health care to deliver really good customer service at a time when most online grocery delivery companies just use gig labor. And it's why we are vertically integrated and we do things like pick up our packaging um, and have 100% reusable, reusable recyclable, recyclable and compostable packaging in every box. And we bring that to you same day. So if you think about the quality of food, the investment we're making in facilities and jobs and the fact that we give it to you same day, uh, that, that, that's pretty cool to me, but I'm biased. If you think about that relative to history um, with a purpose infused in it, it, it becomes more, more and more differentiated. So I'm going to actually uh, shift gears here and talk about the, the summary of what I just mentioned as we deliver California's best groceries and meals. I want to talk about the customer because I think that is the theme of this class and of reimagining the customer. Um, and and you should you should care more about what the customer says than what that than what the category or, or I say. So pre-COVID, um, we were actually pretty focused on serving one core customer. We call her Marissa internally. Uh, and it's really a busy parent who strives to balance it all. It's somebody who cares about uh, compromise, who cares about quality, but doesn't want to compromise on convenience. And there's roughly 10, 15% of every major market um, is this core customer. These are people with kids under the age of 10 at home, usually like one or two working parents. Um, they care about, again, quality and convenience. The, the interesting thing for me here is how much this has changed. If you go back to this slide, this used to be by far our biggest customer. It's actually changed a lot in age and demographic and family size in use case. Um, we just finished a pretty fascinating uh, customer insight study at GoodEggs. And we found that there was really three personas and three jobs to be done that people were coming to GoodEggs for. Uh, and hopefully there's a, these are useful for some of you. Um, number one was still kind of this same demographic. They're people who use Good Eggs as their full primary grocer. We are their one-stop shop. They get 70, 80% of their at-home food needs from us. They have big order sizes. They come back to us every single week. They never leave the service. They tell all their friends. Those are great customers. Um, the two that have come in are actually, are actually a, they're different. One is somebody who uses us almost exclusively or the largest category they use us for is produce. And I'll get into what we do in produce in a second. Um, 
but they, they, they've seen that we have much better produce than the competitors and they use us for that. We call these people gourmands because they're, they're, they don't care about convenience. They're actually willing to go to a baker, willing to go to a farmer's market, willing to go to a butcher to get to some special cut. Um, they're not as convenience oriented as the first. And then the third are people who, who are almost meal shortcuts. So marinated meats, prepped, prepped vegetables, things that help them ready to heat meals, meal kits, things that help them get dinner on the table. That is actually the primary reason they're coming to Good Eggs and maybe they'll buy, buy groceries sometimes, but that's the, that's the place they start and that's the job they have when they use us. So a little bit of customer nuggets there, um, who they were and, and how, they, how that's changed. This one gets into food systems. So our thesis for this customer, um, both the prior one and the more broad three personas I mentioned, was that having expertise in fresh is really critical. Uh, you, you may not know this, but we, the average grocery store, I think about a third of their business is perishable or fresh. Good eggs, uh, more than 75% of what we sell is perishable and fresh. So think about that as like the traditional outside perimeter of a grocery store you go see with produce and proteins um, versus the center store, which is all these packaged goods. In a way, Good Eggs shifts that mix entirely. So there are, our, our perimeter store is, is our center of store. Uh, because we believe that fresh is critical, we've really, as I mentioned earlier, thought about how we source products. And we buy 70, 80% still direct from producers within 250 miles. And as you can see by the stats here, it's very different than how people buy today, not different than how people bought before. And we have technology to help us do this. Um, but this, this, you think of like, we're buying direct and local. It's coming into a central warehouse. We have a big one in Oakland that's 120,000 square feet. It comes into Oakland and we're turning that inventory, moving that inventory, selling that so quickly that oftentimes from when something is picked, when something is baked, when something is caught to your door is less than 24 or 48 hours. Um, and so this is a definitely a very different way of buying. And I can talk about the pros and cons of it, um, but I think it is necessary to, to serve this customer need uh, in, in the future that will exist and to have differentiation. Here's a little bit of a, a visual. Um, I will hit play so it's larger. Bit of an eye chart, but the, the, the top half of this, this is using strawberries as an example, which are just coming to season. I think, well, your lemon tree just started blooming. I think I tasted the first strawberries like two weeks ago that were local. Um, and the top of this is about how good egg sources and the steps that go into that. And the bottom view is how a, a traditional big grocer or industrial supply chain sources and brings things to, to the table. Uh, the summary headlines are in here, like we are prioritizing taste and quality and nutrition. And that means often one to two days old from when something was picked to when it gets to your door. That is not how a Kroger or a Safeway of the world uh, prioritize or do things. They're prioritizing, which makes sense for them, durability, uh, consistent price, uniformity and consistency. And that means often they have consistent supply, but it's 10, 12 days old when it lands on shelf. A lot of people don't, don't know this on fresh and it's kind of gross once you know it. So sorry for filling you in. If you look at the four, four steps in the Good Eggs example here, we're picking really unique varietals at optimal ripeness. So there's Gaviola, there's Albion, there's, there's Seaside, there's, there's like seven or eight different exceptional strawberries when you eat them. They are the best strawberry you've had short of like growing one in your own garden. Um, that is, again, most strawberries sold in a grocery store are like one variety, which is bred for durability. So we're picking great varieties, picked it up in optimal ripeness. We're pulling them from these local producers less than 150, 200, 250 miles away, bringing them into our space in Oakland. Uh, Oakland is, if you envision it, it's like half 60%. Um, big, tall, 30 foot high walk-in coolers with different humidity and different temperature zones. So we're storing something at the right temperature based on the product that it is. And then we're delivering that almost kind of like Dell just in time style to your door, still at its peak flavor and freshness. Not a lot of steps, not super complicated to understand that, but uh, that makes sense to me. That is not how things are done in, in the rest of grocery. 
uh, how most people do it in grocery is they, they pick a variety that is durable of, of strawberries. They pick it with white shoulders, which means it's not red, it's white, um, before it's actually at peak, peak ripeness, because once it gets to peak ripeness, it's less durable. They then ship it thousands of miles across borders, across countries, across, across states, um, and it sits at a, at a distributor who's taking this in from all these strawberry growers across all over the country. They're then storing that thing in the, that, that case or that pallet of strawberries in a cooler for days. They throw a bunch of gas into it, which turns it from a white berry to a red berry. It's called ethylene gas. And then they ship it more miles to a grocery store where it sits on a shelf, not at optimal temp or humidity. And then you purchase it two weeks after harvest. It's never been a peak flavor. It never had a chance of being peak flavor or a peak variety. And you drive it home and you eat it, you eat it. Um, and feed it to your family. Hopefully, maybe you do or don't. But that's a massive difference. And I hopefully I'm not boring you with like the inner workings or the history of food. Um, hopefully you want to know like where your food came from and how it works and how it flows. And, and it starts to make you ask some more questions and like get curious. Why was this berry? Why was this Masamoto peach so good? Um, it'll take you on an interesting journey. I'll pause here too on my soapbox and see if there's any questions. There's a couple questions, but I think they might be better when we get to the discussion because they're kind of uh, more about the business and the business model and expansion. So maybe we'll, you know, we'll wrap this, we'll take a short break and then we'll come up and delve into these um, really more specific questions. That sounds great to me. Uh, I, I could go on for a couple of minutes, but if you want to stop too, this is actually a natural break. You want to stop now for a break or do you want to? Um... Maybe I'll give you one more customer insight. So I'll yeah. do one more slide and then, okay. and then we'll break and we'll shift to okay. camera. Does that work for you? That's great. Awesome. All right. I'm going to show you one other thing because I've mentioned like blurring categories. Here's a view of all the steps of cooking and shopping. So planning, shopping, delivering, prepping, cooking, eating, it's a lot of steps. And again, let's bring it back to like what a customer wants. Our customer wants a one-stop shop for the best groceries and meals. But if you think about how people cook in the Bay Area where most of us, I believe, live, most people cook three to five nights a week. This is like a family, not necessarily a college or a graduate student. They'll do takeout one or one or two nights a week, and they'll go out to dinner one night a week. Uh, that's that's actually easy to understand. But you think about all the places you or we have to go to figure that out. The top of this of this chart here, top left, there's meal kits and meal services. On the top right, there's tons of meal delivery and takeout. Um, on far, far out to the right, whether it's open table or resi, right? Those are places, ways you can make reservations online. Um, Chuck, Chuck's on our board, who is the founder and CEO of Open Table, and he still talks about how until Open Table existed, like everybody had to call the restaurant and leave a voicemail. Um, and that again was not that long ago. On the bottom is how do I fill the fridge and get groceries as opposed to meals? And uh, there's groceries, there's Trader Joe's, there's Safeways, there's Bevmos of the world. And now, what you saw in that, in that other slide, there's been this shift towards online. And so now, whether it's Thrive Market for dry goods or Amazon and Whole Foods for grocery or Instacart picking from a store of a traditional grocery, you have a lot of options. Um, the other reason I shared this slide with you is it's just, it's, it's a consumer reality. But try to think about like what customer segments, um, how many places they have to go, how many fragmented choices they have, how many compromises they have to make based on what matters most to them in each of these scenarios. Um, and think about a way to deliver more of a one-stop shop for these people. Um, I think for now in our time, I'll, I'll say Fabulous, stop. fabulous Bentley, really informative, really interesting. Um, we're gonna give everybody a five minute break. We're gonna come back at 7.20 and gonna have Samuel and Lisa and Douglas and. Josh, ask their questions of you. We'll get into a little bit more discussion, but um, thank you so much for this overview. And um, we'll get into the conversation at 7.20. So we can pause the recording. Well, do you or moderators want to take questions? How do you want to sure. do that? Sure, I'll moderate and I'll call on people 
We've got, um, we've got, you've got an alum in the crowd here. One of our graduate students. Evan. Oh, a good eggs alum from NOLA. Worked. Yeah, he worked. So he wants to ask you a question. I'd like to call on the students and have you um, come on screen and address um, Bentley just to make it a little bit more interactive. So um, I'll try to get to all of you that have put great questions here in the chat. But um, Bradley, I mean, Bentley and I were just talking about timing and how um, when you're so committed and energized about an opportunity that you go that extra mile to like battle through the obstacles. And I was just reflecting and saying, but sometimes you just don't get the timing right. And I was about to share a story with you where um, back in 2007 and 2008, my, my partner, Andy Donner, who's a Haas alum, he was really into like, he saw digital health coming and he did a lot of research on it and he was working with academics and scientists. And he said like, the future is gonna be connected exercise. And, um, you know, people are gonna well, like- You said 2007, this was, Will? Two, 2007, yeah. 2008. And he's like, people are gonna to wanna to exercise together online. And we found a company called Espresso Fitness, which was a, exercise bike with an interactive video screen and the ability to connect it to other bikes. You know, that is sound good. familiar? That is, ama that is amazing. Sound familiar? So we okay. invested in Espresso Fitness and then in 2008, we had the economic crisis, all the debt. At, and at that time, people were not buying $1,500 or $2,000 bikes to be at home. They were going to the gym. And at that moment, the gyms, uh, all their credit and debt dried up because of the great crash and that, you know, that economic moment. Yeah. And the company basically was sold for hardware and software and we wrote off our investment. And then 10 years later, you have Peloton. So, um, you know, there's just a difference between like seeing the future and then being there at the right time. But anyway, and, I, you can't, I mean, honestly, like GetX started 11 years ago, right? So they were a, they were one of the first companies to do online grocery in the U.S. Right. And and candidly, the first five years were a real struggle, I think, because of timing. Um, yes. Somebody somebody asked that. earlier, like, where was the U.S. relative to global players? The U.S. was behind at that point, so to me, actually, it did not seem risky. Um, but that's because I'd lived in a country where it was becoming the norm and I'd, and I'd like, I'd, I'd experienced it. I, it would have been hard to believe that if I had not experienced that life. I just think this is a great topic for the, the students because one of the things you're gonna wanna think about with your change making plans that you're gonna articulate in your final project is really what indicators give you a sense that mm. the timing is right because the data is always backward looking it's really easy for us to look back now and see the numbers. The projections that Bentley shared are pretty exciting about the trends and we can, they're pretty predictable now, but the more predictable they are, the more people see them and the more people um, consider entering the space. So how do you see the future that's not as clearly charted out? Because that chart that you just shared didn't exist when the founders of Good Eggs started this business and yeah well i actually we'll go to q in a second but i think this is such an important point um i have i actually think about this all the time uh and how do you get how do you have the good fortune of exceptional market timing um and i think that's a really common thread about companies to achieve scale and change the world i don't have an ego to think that i'm that great i think timing has a lot to do with it so whether we go back way to cliff bar when i was there like you remember this cliff bar launched energy bars when there was power bar and cliff bar and there was no shelf space in grocery stores it was an emerging category, the bar category. Organic had not yet hit mainstream. And to dot today, of course, those things are ubiquitous. At Plum, when it was 2008, we, we were the first one to do that squeezable pouch for baby food. And that was a slow moving oligopoly that was dominated by glass jars. And a new packaging format was a gigantic risk that wasn't clear it was gonna work. Uh, Good Eggs is the same. I can go through a million examples without boring you with my stories. It's more like when you choose after, after Haas, what to go into, like don't, don't make market timing an afterthought, make it a primary thought. Mm, yeah, great, great advice. 
um, yeah, we'll come back to that. So let's let I want to jump to Evan first because he's your alum and uh, back in 2014. So Evan, why don't you come on and we'll spotlight you? Uh, and tell me what you learned that I don't know. Yeah, thank thank for that Bentley. It was good to take a trip down a uh, memory lane. I got I broke out my vintage Good Eggs hoodie for the occasion. Oh, that is that is real nice. Yeah, so it was actually my second job out of uh, university. My first job was on the producer side, so I worked for an urban farm that um, sold some produce through Good Eggs, and then I worked on the ops team for a year as well. Wow. Um, can, can, well, I, I, can you share like a one minute, like what, what it was like back then? It was great. We were slinging. I think I was employee number like less than 10, I think wow. in the New Orleans hub. And we scaled in that year out to like 20 something. You would probably know better than I, 25, 30. Um, we, we were there. We went through three different hub, like hub locations. It was, and and was, was Tess running that at the time? Yeah. Tess, wow. Tess was the one who onboarded me. Um, and then she, she was replaced um, by a guy named Leo, who who, uh -huh. who came on as the ops lead. Um, and yeah, it was great. Like you know, I was low level out of university, but um, we were like iterating, and they were you, you guys were actually like asking us for our feedback on stuff, and it was really awesome um, experience to be that involved in like the um, working things out, figuring out how you know what's working, what's not, and and um, really good ops education for me. I took it forward in my career for sure. Thanks for sharing that. I feel yeah. like, uh, being a, a company like that at that stage, pre my time, I, I think we had, we had so many people who were passionate about food. I, I've heard you can validate this who, who had like, like college degrees or graduate degrees, but were picking groceries or schlep, schlepping groceries, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Driving, <laughs> and iterating, like you said, trying to figure it out. Driving the transit. I know I see the good eggs boxes around here now. And I, I was, I was dropping those things off at one point, you know, um, yeah. just doing delivery routes. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny 360 experience, but, um, yeah, with all that in mind, I, I'm, I'm really curious just to hear you mentioned something about, Good Eggs looking to expand. And I, I know the, the theory was that you were gonna kind of really drill into the Bay Area market and like perfect things locally before expanding to other markets. But um, given ever, all of the trends that you outlined, I'm wondering kind of what your projections are, how, how you're kind of uh, positioning yourself to, to um, expand it or if so. Yeah, it's a very good and timely question. Um, the really fast history on this one, you probably remember this, but I, so I joined Gigs five months after they'd scaled back from four markets to one. So it was in NOLA, um, it was in LA, it was in New York, and it was in San Francisco Bay Area. So they'd scaled, scaled back, which is a longer conversation. Um, the first thing I, one of the first things we did, not I did, was we had to fix some of the foundational things. And so we actually restructured the company, brought on new investors and said for the next nine months, I don't want to have a single conversation about growth. It's not that I don't care about growth. I do care about growth, but uh, we can't do that while building a foundation simultaneously. Um, that nine months actually turned into both foundation building and growth in one core market of five years. So for the first five years, we just were in the Bay Area at a time when this, it was clear this was changing. It was clear that people were launching, you know, and opening new locations with asset lighter, asset heavy models, really, really fast. Um, that that's hard for a number of reasons because it requires laser focus, it requires discipline, it requires saying no to a bunch of good ideas which are otherwise exciting. Um, but at the end of that, what we learned is we learned, and we're not perfect by any means, and we never will be. We're just getting started. But we did learn how to like have product market fit with the core customer, and that resulted in amazing spends, amazing basket size, amazing frequency, amazing retention, really efficient word of mouth, which drove a lot of growth. It also meant that we knew how to actually um, we knew how to deliver groceries and have positive contribution margin or unit economics or profitability uh, in a way that actually not many online grocers have have proven. Um, that takes us to actually 60 days ago, um, January week two, we launched in LA I think we publicly announced it like two or three weeks ago. Um, and LA, I think is actually like three sub regions. Uh, we launched actually orange County. I don't know if it's this week or next week, uh, in San Diego in 45 days. So for us, that's a big deal <laughs> to suddenly triple essentially the customers you serve in less than a 90 day period. 
The reason I'm comfortable doing that now is because we did that foundation building piece. So in many ways, it is not that high risk anymore. And it's a pretty clear return to go into new markets. It's just a question of like, how fast can, can we scale it? But we're not fixing the plane while we're doing that. Um, if, I, if I look three, five years out, I still wanna have deep roots in few markets for a core customer. I don't wanna be everything to everybody everywhere. So maybe in three or five years, we'll be in five West Coast markets and have real meaningful scale in those markets and presence and be enduring. Um, I could go on and on, but that's my short Hey, point. Bentley, could you, would you mind just talking a little bit more about product market fit? What is that? We haven't talked about that in this class, and um, it's certainly an area of business design um, that has become really essential. And it's, it's again, I think I'm, I'd like to underscore it because I think the students, as they start to develop their change maker strategies, understanding product market fit might be helpful. Yeah, I'll give you my, my, my shorthand on this one. And I'll, I'll give an answer actually for a retailer or an e-commerce player like Good Eggs, and I'll give one for a, a brand like Edwalla or you know, a consumer package good. Uh, on consumer package good, which is where actually most of my career was before Good Eggs, a product market fit was really, you prove that through velocity. How fast does something turn on shelf? Are people coming back and buying it over and over, which is a sign that they really love that product. Um, that's, that's to me, one of the best signs of product market fit is, is turns on shelf or velocity on shelf. Well, and that points to the fact that food is a consumable. Correct. So historically, we would build a consumable packaged food company by demonstrating that people would buy it over and over again. And we've seen, you know, in recent times that um, some companies have gone to lengths to actually manipulate that um, experience on the shelf. I won't go into great detail on that, but, you know, um, some companies I've noticed lately in the product area um, have so much promotion and storytelling about the growth of their, you know, the appeal of their product, but basically what they're talking about is just getting more doors, right? Getting more locations rather than getting velocity. Yes, that's a huge distinction, which I feel like is a class in itself. Yeah, that is a class in itself. But I'd, I imagine Adwala or Republic of Tea, I imagine that you, you proved relatively earlier, learned how your product would move faster and have higher loyalty than other beverages on, on, on shelf. Can I tell you a quick story? Because this yeah. is, this is um, interesting. When I first, and the students haven't heard a lot about my own background, but ask when, I was question, starting, a rich background here. when I was starting Republic of Tea, I had found this incredible uh, tea that uh, was made in Hamburg, Germany. And it really wasn't offered in the United States. And I, it was a peach tea and I added ginger to it, which created a ginger peach tea. And it was a flavored tea. And I, I had a friend named Elliot Hoffman who had a company called Just Desserts. And Elliot was one of the early sort of socially responsible entrepreneurs of his day. And Just Desserts helped, um, made beautiful food and they also helped formerly incarcerated people get back into the workforce. So their, their name, Just Desserts, had a double meaning. But anyway, I, I was getting ready. You to, carry them on good eggs too, if you want to go full circle. Okay. okay. So I was getting ready to um, take Republic of Tea to market, but I wanted to test the product market fit. And Elliot was um, doing a demo at the Costco in South San Francisco which has many, many little Chinese ladies who know tea, like generationally, they know tea. And so I actually sort of challenged myself. I said, if I could put a tea in front of that group of people who are really knowledgeable about tea and really specific and that they would think this was a really good tea, I might be onto something. So that's how, that was one of my first experience. I, you know, I literally went into the store. I spent all a couple of afternoons with Elliot. He was serving, you know, muffins and cookies and I was serving tea. And I was convinced after that, when I saw the enthusiastic response on those people's faces, that I might have something that would cross over from a knowledgeable customer to someone that, 
you know, would be new to it. Hmm. Anyway, okay, sorry. I like those early days of innovating and trying and being in stores. Yeah, but that was product market fit, right? Like, so one of the things we've learned in entrepreneurship in the last years is just the edict is like, go do something, you know, go build something, make a prototype, go test something, go get out of your head, out of your business plan, out of your spreadsheet and go test it. So how do you do that in LA? Like, how do you de-risk cool. that market? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly answer the last question, then I'll go I'll go to that one. Yeah. I, I think product market fit and CPG is velocity, and then I think yeah. business business viability is essentially gross margin. In a company like e-commerce, I think product market fit is measured in are people ordering large orders? That's that's order size and frequency combined. It's like how much do people spend a year with a service? And then there's a more qualitative measure, which is NPS score, like net promoter score, how much do people love the service? Those two things are validators in our business that we are delivering a product that people enjoy. And our version of gross margin versus CPG is unit economics or contribution margin. How much do we make on each order? So that's business business kind of viability and product market fit. All right, you had another question, Will, which was- Well, let's get, um, let's get Lisa Chen out. Lisa, are you here? Do you wanna come forward and ask your question? Yeah. Hello. Hey, fresh direct alumni. That was the real, that was the real pioneer. Yeah, I know. Super old school. Um, thank you for being here. And also thanks, Will, for that really cool anecdote. Um, I guess I I was thinking about this question more from a consumer standpoint, which is just like to what extent is GoodX trying to educate customers or potential customers to learn how to cook in season, you know, as someone who just grew up not learning how to do that um and as taking a step back like how does that picture change when you leave california you know yeah what is our role in education i i don't know if i have a good answer there um i know what i'd like to do and i know what's <laughs> how what i would like to do may or may not be feasible uh i think that i think I think that we talk about internally often, like how do you get, use a strawberry as an example, how do you get a great strawberry, you don't have to cook that, but how do you get that into somebody's hands so it's so good relative to what they're used to eating and that it makes them stop and, and ask more questions. I actually think that limiting the friction and increasing the convenience to trial of food that actually was grown with integrity, I think that is probably the best way to get people curious about food and then eating seasonally and cooking more. Um, I don't know if blogs or education or videos, I don't know if we have the reach or the power to do that because it's such a complicated thing that as soon as you taste it, it's like visceral. I mean, I remember this at Cliff Bar. I grew up with a French grandmother um, who loved food, but until I got to Cliff, I actually didn't understand the ripple effects of food uh, on a larger ecosystem and how important it was. And my curiosity, it was based on both taste and that company at the time. Um, that's a good question. I wish I had a great answer. I, I don't. I don't make up answers and I don't have good ones. So uh, no, do, you have a, do, you, do you have a perspective on it? Um, I think that as someone who has like heard about good eggs and been curious to try it, try good eggs. I think my personal reluctance has been like, oh, like I might not know what to do mm -hmm. or like trying CSAs and stuff. Like I might not know what to do with this. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to do with the chart or like, I never grew up like eating this. Yeah. And so was just thinking about generally like the idea of learning how to eat things that are in season and that being better. And like, to what extent different, yeah, companies are like trying to, to push, to push the education portion of that. Yeah. I will think on this more and listen and think about your perspective. I guess, Lisa, do you think there's an opera, you know, is there like a business or a partnership opportunity there? You know, if you were to start a, um, you know, maybe Bentley doesn't want to go into that business and I could understand why he doesn't, but is there an opportunity to like create a cooking um, channel on YouTube? <laughs> it's advance notice of what's the seat what's in the csa box next week yeah and yeah yeah absolutely and i, I i'm like i used to i used to run a school nutrition program at a school district actually hmm. and so something that i've been thinking about a lot too is like how do you how are we balancing like the food system incentives with the school nutrition and the school finance incentives 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, definitely to your point, Will, like, I think a lot about like who should be pushing the food educa education part and like whether, whether public schools can be doing it, whether like K-12 schools can be doing it. Cool. Yeah, and as, as a dad of two kids who are seven and 10, I actually, that is probably a good basic example of this. Like when they yeah. grow something, they eat it and they're interested in it and they try to cook it. Um, mm -hmm. And when they don't, they're less interested. <laughs> yeah, Which absolutely. Is, uh, I'm Thank gonna bring you. Douglas Watts up for your question about storefronts. Let me see here. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I think before COVID, there was this trend happening where some large scale grocery stores were experimenting, like chains were experimenting with like the small convenience size, fresh forward, like predominantly fresh options, closer to people, like denser urban centers, yes. um, storefronts. And I was just wondering to get your take on that as like a potential competitor. And also uh, like, could your value chain with the super fresh um, operations work with a storefront that looks kind of like that and would that be a potential future for good eggs where we've seen other predominantly internet-based delivery-based companies like warby parker have physical storefronts or amazon similarly? yeah uh, excellent question too I, I, one i i don't i don't think like solely e-commerce is the future i think omnichannel is the future and i think there's a lot of data that supports that so i think i think you'd be able to have a great to me i'm like pro or anti online or in person i'm like i'm i'm pro good experiences and <laughs> anti-bad anti experiences. Uh, I We actually, in LA, when we launched, we have a big fulfillment center, like a big warehouse, kind of like we do in Oakland. We actually have a smaller node that is 10,000 square feet, kind of in Santa Monica, to actually experiment and test this particular concept in question. Um, my thesis right now, could be, could be wrong, but my thesis is that if you have a small format store with less assortment, with quicker delivery, um, but it doesn't have to be like in 15 minutes, um, it can be just quicker. Uh, if it's differentiated food for a audience who cares about differentiated food, I think it works. I personally think it's really hard to just have the same commodities and the same brands and the same items that everybody else has with a small format. I don't think it's sufficient differentiation to break out and build either product market fit or a good business. That's my current perspective. You'd have to have to kind of be like a farmer's market in a store yeah it could be farmer's market it could be it could be like i don't know specialty type a it could be the high-end liquor it could be the hot sauce shop i don't i don't even know what it is it but it has to be differentiated right your collection your merchandising your curation has to be different than what everybody else has to stand out because this market's just it's big and therefore it is will always be competitive thanks douglas i also don't think i can we can beat like an amazon or a door but an amazon is a good example i talked about this with my team we should never be surprised if they have faster delivery and cheaper prices. Uh, we shouldn't try to win on those two dimensions. Because they'll always subsidize it to get people hooked. That's yeah. part of their strategy. You know, we've got a lot of questions about scale. And I think one of the things I've always appreciated you about you, Bentley, is your humility. And your you have great ambition and you have sort of respect for um, you know, what it is. And I mean, one of the, one of the arts of being a successful entrepreneur is to see things as they are, not as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of entrepreneurs want to will things into being, and sometimes you can do that, but you know, usually when you do it, it's, it's luck and good fortune. It's not your own doing. So I always appreciate your humility. And I think that, you know, in food, what's refreshing about what I'm hearing from you and good eggs is that there is a, an appreciation of like limits of growth. Um, you know, we read a paper by Danella Meadows about dancing with systems and her famous work was about limits to growth that um, not everything scales. And um, that doesn't mean that you can't have an incredibly beautiful, successful, profitable um, business, that it doesn't scale infinitely. And I feel like um, I just want to go on record saying, I think we've become sort of brainwashed a little bit about infinity, you know, as being the goal of um, companies, particularly those involved with tech, that there's just like no nothing big enough. And, um, you know, so I think that what I hope the students are hearing tonight is that there are, there's a specialized set of conditions that create 
the conditions for good eggs to thrive. And, yeah. um, you know, it, you just happen to be in California, which is the sixth largest economy in the entire world and the greatest producer of fresh vegetables and fruit in the entire nation. Yeah. So, you know, what works in California may not work in Brunswick, Georgia, and that's okay. And, um, you know, I think it's okay to pursue um, solutions and opportunities that, um, you know, obviously you have to get to a scale that the business works yeah. and that the capital investment is paid back mm -hmm. and that you can have that velocity that you're talking about and that density of customer base, but it doesn't have to be everything to everyone. I agree. I mean, we, 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 I always think about like, what is, what's our growth with purpose? Just to be clear, I want to achieve big scale, but I don't want to achieve big scale while losing our purpose. I think that's, that, that's where it breaks. And there's some capital efficiency of like, just pushing it too hard doesn't work. Uh, I think the difference is my desire for scale is not for, for myself. It's, it's because in this moment, we talked about in the first part of this conversation, this category is transforming. And I don't think Amazon, I don't think Instacart, I don't think Safeway, they're not evil. I just think they're largely indifferent about food. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want the people who create the future of our food system and have the greatest share and the greatest scale to be indifferent about food. Um, so part of That's this even so, like foundational so chapter in growth, it's just, it's growth with purpose. And this is my constant struggle, honestly, as a leader and a person, and also as a dad, like how do you achieve real scale while maintaining purpose, and in my case, also being a present father, like that, everybody can define success in their own way, but those things matter to me. I don't really want to sacrifice any of those three things. Well, I so appreciate that. I mean, you really, um, you really hit the nail on the head for me. I mean, there was a story in the New York Times, which I'm sure you saw a week or two ago, about the the Amazonification of Whole Foods is nearly complete, and um, you know, to that point, people who don't necessarily care about food or now, you know, running that show and oh. it's changed. It's changed, you know, profoundly. So I really appreciate your sense of values and ethos. Um, and let's, let's go to, there was one other question up here that I was hoping, um, Matthew Choi, can you ask your question? Are you there, Matthew? Yeah. Is my mic working? Yes, it is. Okay. So I don't have a camera, unfortunately. Okay. That's all right. Um, we see your picture. <laughs> um, I need to find my question again because I actually don't remember. I haven't had dinner yet. So, <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask, you know, this is a question where I was like, do I really want to ask this? Because it might seem borderline disrespectful. Ask away. Um, <laughs> So I will make it clear, you know, very upfront. I don't intend to make this seem disrespectful, but I'm just genuinely curious. So I looked at Good Eggs website and I see that you guys have multiple CSAs. And at the moment, I actually get my produce from a local CSA in Half Moon Bay. And they have the same approach, you know, in terms of the food chain and you know, the benefits that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm kind of sick. Um, you know, the benefits that direct from the farm offers versus traditional methods. So I wanted to ask, but how do you see the future of good eggs? Because there is this conversation I had with my friend a while back in terms of Amazon and supporting local stores. And I don't know why, but I just kind of thought like, hmm, you know, CSAs on good eggs, CSAs that aren't affiliated. How do you think the relationships of farmers who aren't affiliated with good eggs will be and whether or not the expansion of good eggs might result in a kind of join us or possibly kind of suffer type of thing, similar to how Amazon grew big and how, you know, now some local stores find it hard to compete. Because how do you compete with Amazon if Amazon has all these planes, you know, the infrastructure and whatnot, where they can offer, you know, same day shipping, or they can have loss leaders, you know, uh, versus a local store where it's like, they have to pay for rent. 
Uh, well, first of all, I thank you for having a, a question that's on the more courageous end. Uh, people who know me, like you can't offend me with a tough question. <laughs> um, so I'm actually, I love those type of questions. They make us think harder and, and deeper. So keep on doing that. That's an awesome, awesome trait. Um, for, for your question about how, how might this impact suppliers? It, it does tie back to purpose and I'm not being disingenuous. I don't think good eggs will achieve scale while maintaining its purpose. If we look at the world as a zero sum game, like most retailers where you squeeze your suppliers for every penny, you squeeze your team for every penny. Yeah. You, you, you try to eke as much as you can out of your customers. I just don't think that's the way to build an enduring business. So I think we have to have a model to scale that lifts our suppliers, our customers, our, our, our team and serves our shareholders or else we won't be around. Um, my reason for saying that is if I, if I take myself out of it too, and I think about a supplier lens and I'm open to other perspectives here, but most suppliers I've talked to, they, whether they're small, medium or large, the first question is like, do they care about peak quality, high integrity food? So they're growing it. If so, then their channels really are, have a farmer's market or a CSA, awesome channels, same practices and values that we have. The challenge is like, they're great growers. They're not great at delivering or doing CSAs. And so for them, it's a low volume, uh, high cost channel. Also with high connection to customer. So there's, there's mixed things there. Another option, which is kind of a similar dynamic is they sell to like restaurants, whether it's premium restaurants or fast casual ones that care about sourcing, whatever. They're going to those. It's kind of the same dynamic as a farmer's market or direct to consumer for them, which is it's, it's relatively small size for a drop or a location. Um, and it's, it's not that high volume, but the margin's better. And the third option they have just to go extreme and not make this a long answer is they can sell to a distributor who throws them in with a bunch of other people that their brand is lost, the product quality that they lost, the thing that they cared about most goes into a large stream and is commodified. And in that example, they do get way higher volume, but they get lower margin. Um, so in those three examples, good eggs, what we've heard, this is not for me, what we've heard is good eggs is a really large channel for a lot of these producers and it's growing and we're scaling together in a thoughtful way where we respect their brand, we respect their product, and it's actually a higher margin than if they sold to distributor, a little lower margin than those other ones. But for them, instead of this old world of like an exclusive, uh, we always ask like, are we the preferred channel for you as a supplier? And an overwhelming major majority say yes. Uh, again, we're not perfect. I can give you like plenty of examples where we can do things better for that audience, but that's what, that's what we hear. Um, and that's my current perspective on it. And then CSA buyers like you, we, we offer because we're better at delivering efficiently to doors than CSA or produce grower or B is. We say, we're buying your product anyways. If you want us to do your CSAs too and push people to our channel, we're happy to do that. But that's their choice. We're not forcing it. All right, I see. Thank you. That was a very thoughtful response. Thanks for asking. Well, I think um, I think we're coming to the end of our time uh, tonight, Bentley. And I see there's a couple more questions. And maybe if you want to send those to me, um, I will forward them on to Bentley just for if you have time to to look at them or or answer them. Yeah, happy to. Uh, th this has been you know very rich and you've been very generous with your candor. Um, I think your sense of purpose as a leader uh, really resonates with um, you know what we've been learning in this class and what we care about. And so it's wonderful to have a model uh, entrepreneur sort of begin our session next uh, next week is spring break, but on the 30th, we're going to have Nick Jamay from Sweet Green uh, join us. And so he'll be talking about the um, supply chains around restaurants and how that world is changing. And I'm sure he'll have some comparable data about how people order things online and, and pick them up. Um, so uh, Bentley Hall, thank you so much for joining us. Thank um, you, everybody. Thanks I think for you'll, me. you'll see all the appreciation in the chat for your your presence, and maybe some of our students will be team members in the future chapters of Good Eggs. That would be a, a wonderful opportunity. Come on over. Thanks for studying food and caring about it, and hopefully doing that with your career. Yeah.
Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we'll wish you a good spring break. Stay dry, stay safe, and um, stay healthy. And go cook that comforting meal for somebody you love. And uh, we'll see you on the 30th of March. Back in person, live in the auditorium at Anderson at the Haas School of Business. Have a great night, everybody. Eat something good. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.